this particle conference is focusing on capacity development. What should you do to make sure that we'll have the right brains, right institutions, and the right soft low, soft power uh, by 2015? It's a very, very important building block uh, for a conference that is supposed to design uh, a prototype of an SDG on water and sanitation and summarize what has been done throughout the year. Okay, I think it's key for any policy maker, whether it's at local level, at international level, or at national level, that you have the best available data to take long-term strategic de decisions. Everything we do now will have an impact 15 years down the line. If you look at, for example, the need for water for any energy production, whether that's hydropower, nuclear power, coal-fired plants, all these installations will have a, a shelf life, as we say, of between 20 to 50 years. You need to know now what the risks are that there is not enough water for cooling your plants in the long-term future. We need a different time frame, and for that we need the best available data to predict what is going to happen. That is not just something at local level we need to know, we need to know it at national level, and we need to look at the transboundary aspects. If Sudan, for example, builds dams in the Nile to build a water security for oil in Sudan, which is their very right, and which is an urgent need, what will happen to the downflow streams? What will happen to water security further down the Nile? All these issues need to be factored into a decision making at the present day. Do we have these data? No, we don't have them. It is something we absolutely need to invest in. And we also need to invest in people being capable of dealing with the broader perspective of water issues right now so they can take the, the better decisions five years from now. Absolutely. First, let's create these databases. Mm -hmm. They don't exist still in the form they should. Uh, what would be really required uh, is a very integrated type of database where you have a certain impact to factor in and you can ask the right questions. What will happen in a certain part of the world if you change the agriculture production, if you double the population, uh, if you enlarge a city, if you build a factory? if you build a, a dam on a, on a river, uh, if you have the proper data uh, and integrated data, then very, very quickly can give you a prediction, scientific prediction, what will be the real state of affairs in terms of water, in terms of society on the given territory. It would be ideal if we can not only build that but to make it available to everybody. Certainly, it requires a little bit of education how to use it. Maybe I can just add uh, two things. One, I think the role of journalists is also to build a community of conscious water users. I think very much this is an issue that has not been discussed. When we deal with water problems, we very often look only at pollution or we look at drinking water issues. I think we need to broaden the availability of freshwater resources with an equitable access for all and how we deal with that as a world community. That is something really that journalists can help us deal with also because the water footprint of everything here in the West we consume is enormous. So what we do has a big impact on water availability in the South. Second thing, there are scientific communities slowly trying to build these databases, there is for example the World Resources Institute that looks at water for a multiple use or groups, whether agriculture, industry, ecosystems, household use or energy generation. And we're trying to come to grips with this multiple use integrated holistic way of planning for a water secure world for all. So we're getting there, but as the ambassador has said, we are far from getting to the database we need for the best decision making for the future. If you stick to the national boundaries only, you will never achieve sustainability in terms of water. But in terms of environment, as well. Uh, water does not recognize boundaries. Uh, if you really want to plan 
your water resources and manage your water resources, you have to make an agreement among all users on the same given watershed. Never mind how many boundaries are there. That is also just to add to what the ambassador has said. That is why it is so intrinsically difficult to deal with this because politics is the realm of national entities. Water does not abide by administrative boundaries. And so what we need, this was the one and only issue where coffee cups were literally flying through the negotiation rooms in Rio plus 20, the issue of transboundary water management. Because it is so difficult, whose water is it? Is it upstream? Is it downstream? Is it the energy community or the agricultural community? This is politics. And when scarcity will increase, as the ambassador has also highlighted, that is when tensions will also increase. So there is an even greater need than in the past to look at watersheds, to look at transboundary water management, to ensure that particularly poor people that have no voice in the political arena have access to water. Let's look at the Netherlands because we have lived through this. You know, we are the soakage pit of Europe. The Rhine, the Meuse, they all end in the Netherlands. What did we have to deal with? Water shortage, too much water, and pollution coming from upstream. So what have we tried to do is to build a community of conscious users to make sure that we do not use the river just within our national boundaries, but look at the effects across borders. And again, this has been very difficult. It's a process that took us 20 years to realize. So do not expect that we can fix this in a year. We start talking and it's done. Whose water is it? Which community has a right over that water? But to try and build on these examples of transboundary cooperation, that is what we call water diplomacy, and that's an issue that we now do in the Nile Basin region. With our experience, how we have set up communities of practitioners using data and multiple user groups to get there. We do that in the Nile Basin, we do it in the Inkomati River, we do it with the Senegal River. And to try and work cross boundaries, you need facilitators. That is the role we try to bring to uh, the water diplomacy program that we manage. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not. Where are the pressure points? Very often we forget the role of the private sector. Because politicians, unfortunately, have a very short time frame. They look at two years down the line, new elections coming up, quick results. What does the private sector look at? Will there be a rate of return on any investment I do, agriculture, again, industry, manufacturing, 15 years down the line? They see the strategic value of water. The World Economic Forum has ranked water scarcity as one of the top five global risks that will have a big impact on everything we produce in the future and they see the strategic water of, the strategic value of water. So now you see the private sector ahead of the curve, much ahead of the politicians and the parliamentarians, and actually pressing for that problem to be resolved. I think we're getting there, but we're getting there at a very slow pace. In terms of sanitation, I think the ambassador is also very well conversed with that. Um, Clearly, there's not only an economic return on investment, one dollar invested in sanitation will yield seven dollars in return in terms of employment opportunities for people that don't get sick, health costs that can be avoided. It's very economically rational, it is a human right of people, and it is very important for the dignity, particularly of women looking at the menstrual cycle, that you have proper sanitation value. So it's not just economically, it's a moral imperative to deliver sanitation to everybody in this world. So this is something clearly the unfinished business of the MDGs that beyond the mm. bigger realm of the new and emerging challenges of water that we simply must finish. Ambassador? It's typically an issue uh, which shows that what you need to fix is not hydrology, but you need to fix conditions for human communities in their complexity. Uh, and it leads back a little bit, uh, takes us back a little bit to, uh, to the transboundary issue. Uh, in my understanding, uh, we'll have a much better chance to have a good transboundary cooperation and agreements on water cooperation if the same type of agreements and same types of cooperation are functioning well within one country. Within all the users of water, you will have the proper system 
of adjusting interest and adjusting actions. If you have that culture within your own country, then it will be much easier to translate into the international mm. cooperation. If you have any problem with that within the country, then most probably you will have a difficulty with a similar other difficult country to come to, uh, come to trial.